so part of your job is to explain this new field and these new potentials to people on the levels of, level of policy making, people who are looking to implement and harness some of this creative and, and energy and also economic energy. Um, I was wondering if you could give an example of, um, of some of these ways that you have sort of negotiated within this new field of explaining to people who might not understand this confluence of different sectors and the potential um, for what it can do. I think this is the hardest part of my job uh, because the problem is that most of the policy makers have a very limited span of attention and they love to think of themselves as practical persons, which is the worst. Because as practical, this means that they cannot listen to any elaborated kind of reasoning because this is not practical enough. The problem is that to understand what's going on, uh, not necessarily you can explain everything in 30 seconds. Uh, you cannot explain the law of gravity in 30 seconds. You need at least one minute. So if you are not one minute of attention span, you I mean, you are lost for the law of gravity. Well, this is something similar in my case. So my first problem is how to capture their attention long enough that they can at least understand what we are speaking about. But the second point is to make them time consistent. Because probably once you have them in front of you, and probably you also use some crypto hypnotical kind of skills, but once you have them in front of you, you manage to convince them. Let's say this. But then when you walk away and they take their everyday decisions very easily they can undo exactly what you have been f you know <laughs> steadily and obstinately try to construct with them which means that they think they are deciding along what was agreed or wh along what was planned but they do something completely different in particular what they tend to evaluate of something uh, that they can understand and appreciate is the economic impact of things. But the problem is that the economic impact of things has to be measured and uh, in some cases it's tricky and it's even more complicated the fact that the real, the real benefits of cultural driven development has to do with the indirect effects. For example, we know today that if we manage to uh, make people comfortable with the idea of having regular access to cultural experiences, especially let's say the elderly, this changes completely, for example, their frequency of access to the hospital. In a place like Europe, which is an uh, aging continent, this means that, for example, if you can drop by, let's say, 5%, which is a prudent estimate, uh, the hospitalization rate, if you just implement systematic cultural policies addressing the needs of the elderly, in macroeconomic terms, you are changing European macroeconomy. But I mean, to explain this, you need at least one minute. And after this, you have to um, stick to their mind the idea that this is not simply wasting money on things that don't have economic impact. The economic impact is huge, but you have to have the perception of the ch causal chain that creates this. This is difficult. Uh, I must say that, especially in the Italian experience, which has been for me not uh, the only one, but uh, of course, uh, I am, I'm working extensively in many countries at the moment, but of course I, I maintain my, my, my reference uh, to Italy as the, the place where I teach, where I live, and I would, would hope, by the way, that Italy with this kind of, uh, you know, undisputable culturally based identity would become a place for successful experimentation of these kind of models, but still, I must say that it's very difficult to find Italian policy and decision makers that really get a point. Can you illustrate an example of, of an experience with a situation like that? Uh, well, mm, examples, uh, in, in the case of Italy, for example, the, the failure examples uh, tend to be very similar to each other. And generally there are examples uh, like this. Uh, for example, I had this um, project in Vicenza, which is one of the cradles of Italian architecture, in particular is the hometown of Andrea Palladio, that by the way was recently recognized also as the father of American architecture through the Monticello, Monticello connection, Jefferson and all that. And uh, mm, Palladio built this wonderful, magnificent building in the center of the city, which is the Basilica. 
The ad was abandoned for a while, it was restored with the money of the local bank foundation and initially I managed to convince, for example, not only the town hall but also the entrepreneurs of one of the most intensive entrepreneurial provinces in Italy in terms of concentration of business and especially of creative business. I managed to convince them that this could become a creative hub. So not simply a place where to make uh, the big event, the blockbuster exhibition. In Italy you have this mania of blockbuster exhibitions because they are easy to communicate and the balance sheet is clearly read, readable. Huh? There are so many people visiting the show and this is the proceeds. Huh? Mm -hmm. So it's easy. But of course it's also very, very ephemeral. Huh? Once it's over, it's over. Whereas it would be much more interesting to have a place that produces constantly culture and produces creative contents on an entrepreneurial basis. So I managed to convince the local stakeholders that that was the case. But when the project was completed, the people, in this case the foundation that financed the project, they decided that they wanted a blockbuster exhibition. And since they were providing the money, of course there was no question, no argument. And the whole project was turned upside down and all the work that we did, uh, almost two years of careful focusing on the territory, explaining this to so many different stakeholders and convincing them, making them excited, was burnt in the space of one week. Uh, this is very frustrating. Uh, on the other hand, I think that, well, you have to be very careful with the place that you choose, but there can be cases in which uh, the work can be done in a more stable, sustainable way. Well, Italy is uh, Politically speaking, just to remain at the Italian level, it's it's very turbulent at the moment. So stable is a bit uh, too much, eh? as a bit overstretched kind of description. But but for example, I'm now working as the director of the bid for the city of Siena for the in 2019 European Culture Capital competition, uh, which will elect an Italian city as the European Culture Capital in 2019. And for example, in the case of Siena, although again political turmoil is the case because even the mayor had to resign for the political conflict uh, over there and now we have a governmental officer in, in taking the place of the mayor so turbulent situation but at the same time a, a situation in which uh, i see that in a situation of deep crisis a place like that that has in the province as many as four unesco heritage sites is at the same time willing to go for it and uh, with a very broad uh, I think distribution of uh, competencies and skills and responsibilities that are really committing to making of culture an engine for future development of, of, of the place. Well, again, we have no guarantee of how it ends uh, because uh, probably it never ends. Mm. Probably you just start the process and then you look at what happens and probably at some time the process goes uh, on its own uh, feet, of course. It's not necessary that you are there you know, managing the process the whole time. But of course, my dream is that um, there could be situations that are viable in this respect. I've been working with situations where actually things went out nicely. For example, I'm cooperating a lot with, uh, in, in, in Europe, places like Lille or like uh, the Ruhr. There are places that were successful European cultural capital and where cultural development really made a difference. But I must say that there, the quality of, uh, of the political governance is absolutely outstanding and this was definitely huh, a decisive element for ensuring the sustainability of the process. In many places, especially in Mediterranean Europe at the moment at the European level, the situation is more complicated and finding this level of governance is objectively more difficult. Hmm. Why look at the revitalization of Siena in terms of culture? Why not in terms of something else? That's a very good question. Uh, because I think that once the traditional local economy has been dismantled and it was a rent economy based ba basically on the presence of the bank that was one of the hugest banks in Italy and the most, most ancient in the world, once the bank went into serious crisis, uh, well, mm, you really readily understand that this is not a manufacturing economy. The, uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of the city has been completely destroyed by years of a rent economy and when you're there, what you really see around you is the potential of this, not only of this cultural heritage, but the incredible emotional tension that this cultural heritage creates, which is not simply a background for tourist photographs, but is an ideal context for generation of new ideas, for 
bringing the city back to the days in which it was one of the global hubs of cultural creation in the world. Well, it's a long time ago, but the city is a city that reasons in the long term. You can imagine that still every year, basically, they, they celebrate the year and the, the, the date of the defeat of Florence in the Sinus Florentine uh, War, and it was, I mean, 1260. So this is a city with a long memory. So yeah. we can actually hope for restoring this lost spirit, I think, in this new situation. Hmm. And in terms of, of um, applying this type of thinking and this type of stimulation, economic stimulation through culture, um, to other areas that don't have the same cultural background that Siena has. How do we think about that? That's, I think, is one of the real frontiers of the future. Today there are so many mm, contexts where culture is really becoming one of the big options. Uh, in some cases, it has to do with the deindustrialized cities that want to manage their post-industrial transition. And by the way, the successful example so far especially come from this category of cities. But especially in the emerging countries, there are cities that are either no cultural identity and history whatsoever, or they have one that has not really been cultivated for several reasons in the past decades or even centuries. So in these cases, you have a sort of blank space in front of you and you have to of course, it's, it cannot be a sort of top down thing in which like an orchestra, you go there and you design a wonderful building. First of all, you have to reactivate culturally the local community, and this is very difficult. And this requires a very diverse and, and complex set of skills that, I, by the way, I think no single individual can have. So that's another interesting issue. Working in this kind of context, you have to, go to, to grow very good teams and very interdisciplinary teams that are very well experienced and trained to work together on these issues. Yeah, but I think that in this particular context, uh, uh, we, have, we have really one of the big opportunities for the future because these places tend to understand often more than in Western countries how culture can make a difference culturally because they don't have the prejudices that we have. For example, in Europe, we have had centuries of subsidized culture. So, of course, we tend to be that culture, tend to think that culture should be subsidized. And uh, we don't, don't get, for example, the real potential of cultural industries. In the United States, they get the potential of cultural industries because in some sense, the, the, the nation is born with, more, more or less concurrently, with the development of cultural and creative industries. But for example, in the United States, it's difficult to believe that there can be a future for cultural production outside of the market. That's one of the reasons why, for example, the American cultural industries are so focused on copyright issues and defense on the monopoly on creation and distribution of contents. I think that for in these new countries, you have an enormous mental flexibility for the possibilities that are open by the new scenario, which is a scenario in which practically everybody today is not simply a part of a cultural audience, but is a cultural producer. Every teenager with a laptop today has the potential to, be, to, 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 to make sophisticated sound production and editing, mm -hmm. sophisticated video production and editing, and whatever. And they use it. I mean, it's, it's very easy to see how this is going to be used. And of course, there is a huge debate about the fact that most of this stuff is interesting or not. But this is absolutely pointless debates. Of course, it's a field of experimentation. And when millions of people are attempting to produce contents, most of it will not be interesting for other people. But, but that is not a point. The point is that we are changing completely the ecology of culture, which is not based anymore on a distinction between who produces and who uses, but it's simply an ecology in which all people switch roles depending to the context. And this is interesting because it means that, for example, you can produce and circulate contents outside the market. And this could even have good economic sense. We are just starting to explore the economic models that can make this sustainable. But it's not necessary that all kinds of contents should be sold and bought on the market to create social and economic value. These new countries are much more open than we are to these new perspectives because for them, I mean, uh, they are just beginning now. And if this is the status quo, it's much more natural for them to accept the status quo than it is for us European or for the Americans that have, in some sense, some background, very strong pre-format, uh, pre-formatted attitude towards how to produce and circulate culture. <laughs>